ever heard of Tencent? Odds are, if you are not a Chinese citizen, you haven't. And so it's time to learn a thing or two about the secret Chinese company that owns just about everything. When you think of the biggest companies in the world, what comes to mind? Amazon, Apple, Google, sure. But on the other side of the globe, there's a company that's just as big, if not bigger than all of those listed. That's because that company does for China what a bunch of other major corporations do for the Western world. Tencent started out as a simple chat service and grew into a full scale social media platform and pretty much the only social media platform in China. Today, Tencent is worth more than Facebook. Oh, and did I mention that Tencent is also the largest video gaming company in the world? Well, uh, they are. They own 100% of Riot Games, which owns titles like Valorant and League of Legends. They own 40% of Epic Games, the makers of Fortnite. And they have millions of dollars invested in global gaming powerhouses like EA and Activision as well. They own so much space in the gaming industry that your next late night energy drink fueled gaming session is most likely heavily influenced by them. And even that's not all. Tencent has their own music publishing and distribution company. They produce and distribute films to the Chinese market. They control just about everything that comes and goes from a Chinese smartphone. Guys, you literally can't even function in Chinese society without a Tencent product. That's a lot of power. Now you might ask yourself, hmm, there's a company that provides so many services to a market of over 1.4 billion people that's become pretty much invaluable to daily Chinese life. It'd be a shame if the government were to, I don't know, use it as a weapon? And if you think that, my friend, you do not know how right you are. Ma Hua Teng was a quiet, introverted technology student. He goes by a much different name today. Since his surname translates to horse in English, he has adopted the moniker Pony Ma as kind of a joke. Now, Pony Boy was a talented coder, but very introverted. In other words, uh, he's a software engineer. Much to his dismay, he got noticed for hacking into his university's computer system. For his thesis, Pony Ma created a program that could predict stock prices and sold it to the company he was interning for. An innovative idea for sure, but one thing you'll learn about Pony Ma and Tencent's overall business strategy is that innovation is not their strong suit. Quite the opposite, actually. Okay, so check it out. In America, we have strict copyright and trademark laws. China is, uh, let's say a little more lenient in that area, or maybe negligent. Yeah, yeah, that sounds better. Anyway, in 1998, Pony Ma stumbled across this site called ICQ, an instant messaging service made by Israeli developers. ICQ was an effective chat service, giving users the ability to send instant messages in real time. It was a common practice back in the day for Chinese companies to copy popular Western services, like Alibaba copying eBay, for example. So Pony Ma and three of his friends from college decided to form their own company, Tencent, and rip off ICQ and adapt it for the Chinese market. Literally, they, they just copied it. They weren't even sly about it. Get this, they called theirs OICQ and uh, added a penguin avatar for a logo. That's like copying an Apple Music platform and then calling it JTunes. OICQ copied ICQ, but to Pony Ma and his stablemates credit, they did a decent job tailoring it to the Chinese market. One example of this is that they made the file size substantially smaller than the original. Download speeds in China were poor at this time, so making it easier to get allowed users to get it easier and more quickly. Tencent also made it so anyone could connect to OICQ, whereas ICQ only allowed you to chat with people you knew. After a few rough months, OICQ reached 100 million users. They also had three big problems. OICQ grew so big they needed to buy more servers to host their users. They couldn't buy servers because they were not monetized. Oh, and they were being sued by AOL. Remember when I said that China had that pretty relaxed attitude about things like intellectual property? Yeah, America not relaxed about that. But old Pony Ma had a few tricks up his sleeve. He reached out to venture capitalists, found some key investors, got the money to buy more servers and kept Tencent operational. The AOL lawsuit stipulated that they must cease and desist to using any form of the name ICQ. So they rebranded OICQ to simply QQ. 
In QQ's first year, they reached 1 million users. By year two, they were at 50 million. Not a bad start. They still needed a way to make money though. Fortunately for Pony Ma, one of his employees found something else to rip off. A Korean website that allowed you to buy your own custom avatars. This feature became very popular, the microtransactions became very profitable, and the site reached 100 million users by 2000. Tencent continues to grow, and as they grow, they faced constant competition. Now in sports, competition can help you bring out the best in you. In business, it brings out your ruthlessness. Around 2004, MSN was a global force in the online instant messaging industry and was beginning to break through into the Chinese market. Microsoft is obviously a tough company to go up against, but Tencent had one big advantage, speed. You see, with Microsoft being such a big multinational company, it took longer for things to get done. Tencent could implement changes and features in weeks when it would take MSN months. Tencent was a big company that moved like a scrappy startup and their ingenuity paid off in the form of half a billion total users. Eventually, MSN was squeezed out of the Chinese messaging marketplace. By the mid-2000s, Tencent's board realized that they didn't have to keep copying features and services they found on the market. They started buying up smaller companies that made features that they could incorporate into QQ. And if the companies would not sell or took too long to negotiate, Tencent would just develop their technology themselves. They had a very Vito Corleone approach to mergers and acquisitions. Make them an offer they can't refuse. Tencent had dominated the Chinese chat market, but Pony Ma wasn't done horsing around with the direction of his company. It had come to Tencent's attention that most of its users would use QQ to chat while gaming. A side note, China had two Great Walls. The Great Wall of China that was used to repel Mongol invaders and the Great Firewall that the Chinese government uses to monitor its users, restrict websites, and most notably, redirect users to a Chinese version of the site they were searching for. Get this. The Chinese government has this law that if a foreign company wants to operate in China, they must find a local Chinese company to partner with. That's because China operates their government kind of like a cartel, complete with all the barriers to entry, taxes, and coercion that comes with it. Maybe a few less violent crimes. Okay, with the laws being what they are, Tencent was a very attractive company for foreign gaming companies to partner with, given their huge user base. The problem was that these foreign gaming companies were at the mercy of their Chinese partners. It was a normal practice to be in negotiations for months and then have Tencent change everything right before the red line period of the contract to put pressure on the other party to do their bidding. Some companies partnered, others pulled out, but this didn't matter because if they did pull out, Tencent could just make their own version of a game for their users. Not to mention, they could give these games away for free and charge for the microtransactions. The beauty of microtransactions is that it costs the company nothing to provide digital extras, and they can produce them out of thin air. Copying or porting over popular games and charging your own microtransactions was Tencent's way of printing money. And the crazy thing is, games in QQ aren't even their most popular products. Facebook and Tencent were in a bidding war for WhatsApp when they were for sale, and Facebook won. So Tencent decided to make WhatsApp themselves, and in 2011, they launched WeChat. Unlike QQ, which was made for desktop, WeChat was made specifically for mobile, and this app would start to gain users as it gained features. It started with a push-to-talk button that allowed users to turn voice messages instantly into texts. This was another idea that came from the uh, Tencent Corleone negotiation technique, but regardless of how they obtained the tech, it was a hit. Pony Ma felt a chill run down his mane. Since WeChat was a mobile app, the amount of services they could attach it to were seemingly endless. So they had picture sharing apps a la Facebook and Instagram, blogging apps, social media, dating apps, etc. WeChat just kept bundling more and more features. Within its first year, WeChat reached 100 million users in its first year. It took Facebook about five years to get as many. During the Chinese New Year, it's common practice to gift people red envelopes with money in them for good luck. So logically, WeChat created a red packet function in their 
app to send money to people. 75 million people sent money to each other via the red packet function one holiday season. A collective light bulb appeared over the Tencent HQ. This led to a fully digital wallet app called WeChat Pay, which is now basically the PayPal of China. In some cases, it's actually easier to use WeChat than a debit card in China. By 2015, WeChat crossed half a b -b 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 billion users. I'm talking with a B. It was the app with an app for just about everything a Chinese citizen needs. What could they possibly do next? Become the app with an app for literally everything a Chinese citizen needs. In 2017, WeChat launched mini programs. It's basically its own app store. You know how we would normally have to go to Google Play or the Apple Store to get uh, like the Twitter app? This is like if Twitter was the app store. The move made it so that WeChat was absolutely integral to life in China. You can call a friend, order food, grab a ride, check movie times and pay for everything all in the same app. There's basically no need for any other apps on your phone. And you know what? That sounds kind of nice. I am kind of tired of the prison of choice of apps on my phone sometimes. From its inception, Tencent has reached unprecedented success. They are practically too big to fail. They almost have a complete monopoly on just about any business that can be done on a smartphone in China. If you are not on WeChat mini programs, you don't exist in that market. So they're also pretty much the gatekeepers of who does business in China. So why would the government let any company become so powerful? The short answer is because it saves them the work. For those of you who have been living under a rock, first of all, welcome. Hope you're enjoying all this indoor plumbing and electricity. And hey, thank you for choosing the richest as one of your first YouTube searches. And hey, while you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe and go back under that rock and tell all your hermit friends, yeah? But also China is not a fan of free speech. They look to silence dissent and criticism at every turn. The Chinese government is all about maintaining the idea of Chinese exceptionalism. The government is happy to help Chinese businesses grow into large corporations so that foreign investors are attracted to do business with the Pacific Rim. That's only if these corporations and CEOs toe the line and play ball with whatever the Chinese government desires. So what's the Chinese government to do when a company like Tencent just so happens to become so successful and so integrated into the daily lives of its users that they can't live without it? Why, to use all that private information to censor and silence your critics, of course. Tencent is legally obligated to hand over all personal data of its users whenever requested. And they use that information to monitor, censor, and punish Chinese citizens. Information from WeChat is fed directly into a citizen's social credit score, which can lead to them being essentially shunned from society and unable to receive goods and services. Leaders of message boards can be held accountable for what is said in the chat rooms they moderate. Location data can lead to users deemed enemies of the state to be abducted, and so on. Just as easily as WeChat can make life for Chinese citizens, the Chinese government can make life hell. Tencent started out copying an instant messaging service, but turned out to be the blueprint on how to become a lifeline to an entire country full of people. As they grew, they gained competitors and critics, and in turn, they grew too big to fail. As easy and efficient as they made the lives of their users, the Chinese government can monitor and censor these citizens just as easily and efficiently. Pony Ma started his company with the best of intentions, but has he created a monster? Only time will tell. Thanks for tuning in all the way to the end, folks. Bang that like button, don't forget to subscribe, and keep tuning into the riches for more incredible content.